Warning: Sulfuric acid is corrosive. Hydrogen gas is extremely flammable. Wear gloves and masks when handling them. Hi guys, here is MIH. I have already done a few videos on metal extraction, and I have been focusing mainly on the transition metals and the post-transition metals. However, there are another interesting type of metals that have their own unique properties, and that is the lanthanides, or more commonly, the rare earths. Those metals lie beneath the main table in the periodic table of elements, and they are known to be reactive and have extremely similar properties. They also play a critical role in high-tech products such as fluorescent TVs and certain national defense weapons. Because they are very reactive, one of the major uses for rare earth metals in our daily lives is lighter flints. You've probably seen one of them before in wild survival kits. They are often used with a stainless steel blade and a magnesium block to start a fire. The lighter flint is made from an alloy containing about three-fourths of rare earth, including lanthanum, cerium, prosodymium, and neodymium, while the rest being iron and some magnesium. Pieces of this alloy is also found in old butane lighters as the ignition source. One of the rare earths, cerium, has a unique property of being pyrophoric, that is, spontaneously igniting when scratched. Iron is the only other element that has this property, which then explains why they are alloyed together to form the lighter flints. The iron also serves to harden the cerium since cerium in its pure state is very soft. At this point, you may wonder why the lighter flint contains 4 of the lanthanides instead of only cerium or maybe even all 15 of them. All the rare earths, which is the 15 lanthanides plus scandium and yttrium, can be divided into 3 groups the light, the medium, and the heavy. The three groups have slightly different properties and like to stick together in ores. Due to this, they can also be easily separated. The other two groups of rare earths have different uses, and they are somewhat rarer and more expensive, so the industry decided to go with the light group and use that to make the lighter flints. However, separating individual elements from each other is quite difficult and costly, and must use some exotic materials, such as an ion exchange column. Therefore, the manufacturer decided to not separate the elements one by one and use them as is. This is why the proportion of the elements correspond to the ratio found naturally in their ores. Okay, enough lanthanides chemistry. So now, the objective of our project is to isolate some decently pure sample of lanthanide compounds, mainly focusing on lanthanum and cerium, since they have the largest proportion by weight. I won't be going to fancy methods used industrially, and I don't aim a perfect separation. I just wanted some cerium compounds in particular, because the chemistry of cerium is quite fun and I'd like to explore it. I don't really have much uses for the other ones, so I'll probably just leave them there. But anyways, the basic method is that we first dissolve the flints in some sulfuric acid, and then selectively separating the lanthanides by precipitation. The lanthanum is then separated first from the mixture of lanthanide sulfates. Then, the mixture is converted to hydroxides, and cerium is isolated by oxidizing it to plus 4 oxidation state and using acid to dissolve the remaining lanthanide hydroxides. Then, we obtain cerium 4 hydroxide, and some leftover prosodymium and neodymium still in the solution. Now we can finally begin our experiment. Here I have a lighter flint rod. Normally, the rod is covered in a black protective coating, but I sand it off prior to the experiment, so the surface is a little shiny and metallic. It still has some of the coating on it, so I decided to sand it again just to get them off. After a bit of sanding, this is what the rod looks like. I weighted it on the balance, and it was 25.71 grams, so we got a decent amount to start with. I then prepared the sulfuric acid solution I will be using. I made it by electrolyzing 125 grams of copper sulfate, so there are still quite a bit of leftover copper sulfate. I decanted the upper solution to another beaker, and left the copper metal behind. The copper sulfate wouldn't impact the reaction too much, since it will also react with the rod and produce the sulfate salts, but it generates copper metal as a byproduct, so I'll have to get rid of the copper after the reaction. The sanded lighter flint rod is then carefully dropped into the acid. The moment it touched the acid, it generated a lot of hydrogen bubbles. When the whole rod is put in, a tremendous amount of hydrogen is generated. 
The reaction rate is somewhat similar to dropping magnesium in hydrochloric acid. Meanwhile, a bunch of red-brown flakes appear in the solution. This is actually the copper formed by the reaction of copper sulfate with the metals. When I take the rod out of the acid a moment later, its surface was completely covered in red copper. However, when I put it back, it nearly stopped reacting. The copper was covering the inner core of the metals and stopping it from reacting into the acid. I poked at the copper with a cloth rod and removed some of the coating to get it reacting again. I left the mixture reacting overnight. On the next day, the color of the solution was considerably lighter, indicating that most of the copper ions were consumed by the rod. The reaction nearly stopped. I took the rod out and scraped off a piece of the copper. I then put the rod back in the acid and it reacted quite vigorously. I then went ahead and scraped off all the copper. This time, the rod reacted violently just like the start. Notice that some milky white substance sank down from the rod. This is actually the lanthanide sulfates formed by the reaction. Lanthanide sulfates have a weird solubility curve. Their solubility decreases as temperature increases. We are going to use this property very soon to separate them from the rest of the solution. After another 30 minutes, I took out the rod and its lower part was much thinner. I then put the rod back upside down, which made it react more evenly. Over time, the color of the solution slowly turned from sky blue to slightly turquoise. I tried to light the hydrogen produced, and there were small explosions, but the flow rate was not high enough to sustain the flame. The occasional yellow-orange pops are a small hydrogen fire. About an hour later, the color of the solution turned to a light blue. There are also a bunch of lanthanide sulfates suspended in the solution and also depositing at the bottom. I poked at the rod to start the reaction again and placed the beaker on the stirrer. After half an hour, the color of the solution was not blue anymore and turned to a dark gray. The remaining bits of the rod was still giving off some hydrogen. The beaker is then stirred for the final half an hour and eventually no bubbles can be seen anymore. At this point, we are left with a mixture of various sulfate salts and some copper. The beaker is removed from the stirrer and I let it settle. After the mixture settled, I gave it a good stir to lift all the sulfates off the bottom, but leave the copper untouched. I then quickly decanted the slurry into another beaker. Most of the copper was left in the bottom of the beaker, along with a little bit of lanthanide sulfates. I washed the copper with some more water and poured the washing in the other beaker as well. After the washing, the copper and the salts were completely separated. Some copper will definitely make it to the other beaker, but it doesn't really matter, and we will be removing it in the next steps. I then heated the lanthanide sulfate mixture to about 70 degrees Celsius. A higher temperature will indeed be better, because the solubility of lanthanide sulfates is the smallest at boiling temperatures. This way, nearly all of the lanthanide sulfates precipitate out, and we can filter them and separate them from the iron sulfate and the remaining junk. The mixture is then poured into a funnel and vacuum filtered while it is still hot. The filtration actually proceeded decently fast, but the residue was gray colored, indicating a large amount of copper contamination. I removed the residue into another beaker and put it there. The filtrate was then poured out into the original beaker and boiled again on the hot plate. As the solution boils, more lanthanide sulfates crash out due to the decreasing solubility. The lanthanide sulfates produced in this round is free of copper since the copper was already filtered out. After the solution boiled, I quickly filtered it through the funnel again. The liquid was visibly blue-green due to the ferrous ions. The obtained residue was perfectly white, and it is definitely a lot purer than the first batch of lanthanide sulfates. I then added some extra water to the first batch and boiled it as well. I then transferred it to the funnel and filtered it. The obtained salts were still a bit gray, but it was certainly a lot better than before. I then transferred all the residue to a petri dish and left it drying under the sun. After a week, I came back and proceeded with the second half of the reaction. I took out an ice tray that I put in the fridge. With some effort, I knocked all the ice cubes in the plastic box. I then measured out 100 milliliters of water and dumped 75 grams of ice in it. Then, the lanthanide sulfate mixture was slowly added in. 
As you've seen before, the solubility of lanthanide sulfate in water isn't very high, so it didn't quickly dissolve. The stirring was then turned on. After 10 minutes, all of the salt dissolved and gave a slightly blue-green solution. Instead of what you see here, there should still be a considerable amount of lanthanum sulfate still left undissolved. The solubility of lanthanum sulfate is a lot less than the other three salts, so I plan to use this step to separate most of the lanthanum from the rest of the rare earths. However, the lanthanum content in the lighter flint is probably just too low, and so the lanthanum didn't crash out. Well, this is fine though, and I simply proceeded to the next steps. I tested the pH of the solution, and it was about 3, indicating that most of the sulfuric acid is gone, and we should be left with just plain salts. I cranked open my bottle of concentrated ammonia solution, and started adding ammonia dropwise under strong stirring. Some milky white precipitate immediately appears after the ammonia, which should be the mixed lanthanide hydroxides. I added 2 pipette full of ammonia, which should be 5 milliliters, and I checked the pH again. The solution was now just around neutral, maybe still a bit acidic. I continued adding two more pipettes of ammonia. Notice that the color of the precipitate changes from pure white to a slight tint of yellow. This is because the white serum 3 hydroxide gets oxidized easily by air to form serum 4 hydroxide, which is yellow. After the ammonia additions, the pH turned to a strong alkaline, which is perfect. I cranked the stirring up to a maximum to ensure the chemicals to fully react. After about 5 minutes of strong stirring, I dumped the mixture in a Buschner funnel to filter it. Initially, the filtering rate seemed quite okay, but after a few seconds, it visibly got worse. Apart from the bad filtering speed, you can also see that the filtrate got a slight blue tint to it. This is because the copper impurities occur in the sulfate mixture and get precipitated by the ammonia just like the lanthanides. However, copper hydroxide can re-dissolve in excess ammonia, which then appears in the filtrate as the classic tetraamine copper complex. This conveniently separates copper from the lanthanides. Alright, um, here we are after a thousand years, and guess what, I finally finished filtering the mixture. The filtrate, as you can see, was the beautiful color of tetraamine copper. I then sloppily transferred all of the precipitate to another beaker. You can see that I really messed up, and some of the precipitate got in the filtrate, but that doesn't really matter. I then added about 100 milliliters of water to wash out the rest of the soluble salts. I stirred it around, broke the large chunks, and took out the filter paper. The mixture was then allowed to sit, and the upper water layer was decanted off and discarded. At this point, you can see that the precipitate was visibly orange-yellow. The next step was to completely turn all the serum 3 hydroxide to serum 4 hydroxide, which will be done using our favorite oxidizing agent, hydrogen peroxide. I measured out about 14 milliliters of 7.5% hydrogen peroxide and gradually added it to the slurry. The part that touched the peroxide immediately turned to a vibrant red. In this reaction, the serum 3 hydroxide reacts with hydrogen peroxide to make serum hydroxide peroxide, which is red. I kept adding the peroxide and stirred with my spatula. When I got tired of the stirring, I put the beaker on the magnetic stirrer and stirred it vigorously for a few minutes. When that is done, the color of the solution turned a little lighter, which is probably because the red serum hydroxide peroxide is decomposing to yellow serum 4 hydroxide. I dumped in the final bit of hydrogen peroxide, and the mixture turned back to a dark red. I then cranked up the heating and brought the mixture to a boil. This forces the serum hydroxide peroxide to decompose to serum 4 hydroxide while releasing a bunch of oxygen. After the mixture boiled for about 10 minutes, I am now ready to proceed. I checked the pH and it was around 6, as I expected. Now we are going to acidify the mixture until the pH reaches around 2. I carefully pour in some dilute hydrochloric acid. Not really anything happened, so I checked the pH and it was indeed about 2. Here we are acidifying the solution to dissolve the lanthanum, prosodymium, and neodymium hydroxide to form chloride salts. Cerium 4 hydroxide, on the other hand, has a higher charge and thus displays a higher acidity and a lower solubility product constant, which means that it wouldn't dissolve easily in the acid. I took the beaker off the hot plate and let it settle. 
Just to demonstrate how fast it was settling, I stirred the mixture around and took the rod out. Less than 10 seconds later, the top water layer was already very apparent. After only 40 seconds, I can decant off the water very easily. I let it sit for a few hours, and the precipitate completely separates to the bottom. The top water layer appeared shallow green, indicating the presence of green prosodymium ions. Most of the water was decanted off into a flask, and our precipitate was left behind. I then added more water to wash the serum for hydroxide. I repeated the stirring, settling, and decanting cycle three times in total. In the end, we are left with some clean, pale yellow serum for hydroxide. All of the washings were combined together in the conical flask, and I decanted it to a petri dish to evaporate off the water. We are now left with a bunch of lanthanide chloride solution and some wet, impure serum for hydroxide, and I left them in my lab for a week. Also, I decided to process the waste solution from the first step, where we dissolved the lighter flint in sulfuric acid and copper sulfate. This is the filtrate that contains a bunch of iron, magnesium, and as well as a little bit of our lanthanides. I added some water to the oxalic acid I have here, and added this oxalic solution to our filtrate. It immediately turned yellow-green, along with some precipitates forming. The iron ions in the solution are forming a green complex with the oxalic acid. Upon adding more oxalic acid, more precipitate crashed out. This is now the lanthanide oxalates, which can precipitate out in a very, very acidic solution, while the magnesium and the iron cannot precipitate. I then decanted and discarded the upper water layer and left the precipitate behind. After a week, I came back to my lab. The ceric hydroxide cake has nearly dried and turned to the red color. However, when it is shaken around, you can see that only the top layer turned red and the part beneath it is still yellow. The chloride solutions partially crystallized and in the large crystallization dish, you can see a bunch of pale white crystals separating out. I scraped the ceric hydroxide off and grinded it into a fine powder. Ceric hydroxide and oxide powder is quite harmful and irritating, so try not to breathe them in and wear a mask when handling them. I specifically wanted some anhydrous serum chloride, which I can then electrolyze in its molten state to make serum metal. For this, I measured out 0.5 grams of ceric hydroxide and 2.5 grams of ammonium chloride. They are evenly mixed and placed in a small test tube. I then strongly heated the test tube using my alcohol lamp. The first thing we see is that the ammonium chloride started sublimating and releasing a bunch of ammonia and hydrogen chloride vapors. After continuous heating, some pale yellow substance started condensing on the top of the test tube. It has a slightly distinct color than ammonium chloride. It is probably our desired product, anhydrous serum 3 chloride, produced from the reaction between ammonium chloride and ceric oxide. Like aluminum chloride, it is a covalent molecule and therefore can sublimate and condense on the walls of the test tube. However, upon research, the melting point and boiling point of the compound is way too high for my alcohol lamp, so I'm not very sure what it is. Upon further heating with a blowtorch, the powder turned to a grayish black and released some more vapors. I then tried to vaporize the stuff sticking on the sides of the test tube, and it slowly fell off. When the test tube cools, I tested the product formed. First, the flakes were poured into a little bit of water. There were not apparent reaction, but the flakes slowly dissolved in the water under stirring. Then I directly poured the water into the test tube, and the flakes dissolved immediately. This was a good sign indicating that the substance isn't just unreacted ceric oxide, but it is some sort of water-soluble chloride salt. It is either the intermediate formed in the reaction, or it is actually the serum chloride. I moved on to processing the ceric hydroxide. I dumped all of them, which is 5.56 grams, in an iron crucible. The powder is then strongly heated with a blowtorch. When the flame touched the powder, it immediately turned dark. The ceric hydroxide is decomposing under the heat to form water and serum dioxide. The gas flame was blowing away a bunch of the powder, so be careful not to breathe those in.
After a few minutes of strong heating, I ended up with 4.27 grams of yellow serum dioxide powder. It probably still contains some serum hydroxide, since pure serum dioxide is light yellow, while my sample is orange. I plan to use this serum dioxide to synthesize serum sulfate and some more anhydrous serum chloride. Then I came to my crystals of lanthanide chlorides. My largest crystallization dish contained a pale green solution along with pale white crystals of lanthanum chloride, while the other two dishes contained orange crystals, probably just serum compounds. I tried to pick up the white crystals using a tweezer, but it directly crumbled into a powder. With some effort, I shook the dish and concentrated the crystals together, and then decanted off the top liquid. The supernatant is visibly green due to the prosodymium ions. The residual crystals are then scraped out and pressed between filter papers to dry. This then results in some pale white powder of lanthanum chloride. I transferred it into a vial and the final mass is 2.02 grams. I combined all the remaining stuff in the dishes together. I plan to convert those chloride mixtures to oxides later on. Finally, I took out my dish of lanthanide oxalate and roasted it with a blowtorch to convert it into the oxide. Notice that it is not uniform in all places. Underneath the top layer, there were still a bunch of unreacted oxalates, so the color was a lot lighter. I transferred the brown powder into a vial and its mass is 4.35 grams. I can use this to make anhydrous lanthanide chloride as well, and then electrolyze it to make the metals. Anyways, in this very long project, we extracted the lanthanide elements from a lighter flint rod and converted them to some useful materials, including lanthanum chloride, serum dioxide, and some mixed lanthanide chlorides and oxides. This project is a very big success, partly because it was large, and partly because there are very few information about the rare earths. I'm personally very proud about this, since I worked out the procedure by myself. No doubt that it can still be improved, but it worked and was already good enough. Thank you for watching!